Well, it's my very great pleasure today to talk with uh, Professor Dame Nancy Rothwell, who is the Vice Chancellor and President of the University of Manchester, the largest single site university in the UK. She's an eminent pharmacologist, and she's also an honorary fellow of the British Pharmacological Society. So Nancy, maybe we could just turn the clock back and talk about your early days uh, as a pharmacologist. What made you decide that was the career for you and who really inspired you in those early years? Well, actually, I had a slightly unusual route because I dropped biology at the age of 14 because I found it boring. And my chosen career was going to be art. Uh, but I had a very good art teacher who wisely said, Nancy, you're not bad at art, but you're not good enough to make any money out of it. So my second choice was maths. And then I went to open days and all the mathematicians applying looked odd. So I chose to do, actually it was physiology and biochemistry, but with a lot of pharmacology in it. And I w had no idea of what career I was going to take until my final year project. And I was inspired by my tutor, Mike Stock, who I then worked with for quite some time. And the other two people who inspired me greatly, I heard John Vane speak, uh, and he was amazing. And Jimmy Black, I heard yeah, him speak. And too, both yeah. were amazing scientists, amusing people, nice people. And so I thought, well, maybe I could do that. So when people look at you in your career, I guess the assumption is it all came easy. <laughs> you never had to struggle. True or false? Oh, false, obviously, always. Um, but their, their struggles, they're sort of good struggles in the sense of, like every scientist, you know, you get your grant turned down and the referees are utterly stupid and they got it all wrong and they didn't read it or your paper's rejected or the experiments didn't work for a while or you didn't get that thing you were going to get. But on the other hand, if it was easy, it wouldn't have been fun. You need a bit of struggle. OK, I know, I completely agree with you. Although I think, you know, my first grant was for a fridge, which I didn't get. You know, that wasn't a fun day. Um, but talking of publications, obviously publications are really important on everybody's CV. You have more than 300, I think, on yours. Which of all of those, when it got accepted, were you most pleased with? What do you think the most important scientific discovery you've made over the years? Um, I think I'm going to cheat slightly and say two. Uh, and the first one did get into a very high prestige journal and it was an article in Nature and it was called The Role for Brown Adipose Tissue in Diet-Induced Thermogenesis in 1979. And, and that was quite a big discovery. But actually the next big paper, I didn't get into Nature or Science and I was really sorry about it. Um, but it got very highly cited and that led to a lot of things and that was showing that interleukin-1 receptor antagonist reduces damage caused by a stroke in a completely different field, of course, to the first one yeah, yeah. because I changed in the middle. Yeah. So those, I think, are the two big, big ones for me. And I guess, importantly, in, in, the, in the sphere of pharmacology is animal experimentation yeah. and some people are really shy and nervous about talking about that. You, on the other hand, have been at the vanguard of describing the need for animal experimentation in medical science. Can you just give us your thoughts on that? I mean, do you think we should be doing more talking to the public, the reality versus the myth? I think we should, uh, and I think we should for several reasons, and, and certainly most of the people who've trained with me have been very open about what they do, do a lot of public speaking. I think we have an obligation. However you're funded, in some way, the British taxpayer funds you, either your university or your salary or your grant or something else. And I'm not of a view that people should automatically accept what we do or the need to use animals. It's their personal judgment. I only feel that they should have the facts put in front of them in order to allow them to make that decision. And it's quite worrying how many people don't have the facts and believe things that are myth or, or, or things that are told to them wrongly. And I've, I've been in a few difficult and aggressive um, meetings with people who disagreed with me. But on the whole, most people, even if not, they're not keen on animal use, they appreciate you taking the time to explain it to them. I agree, indeed. indeed. Do you think leaders in pharmacology are of a certain type? What do you think the key skills, and, and pharmacology, we've been doing it both since the 80s, mm. some time ago now, and it's changed a lot over the decades. What do you think the sort of the, the, the key skills that leaders in pharmacology need to have? Well, I, I'm not sure I would say there are unique things because I think there are issues of leadership in almost every walk of life that come through, you know, and engaging with others about 
hoping to have some sort of vision and direction about listening, um, you know, about recognising the need that just because you say something, people won't believe you. I think they're generic skills. I think in pharmacology, um, probably more than some areas of science, pharmacology is a little bit like engineering because it's often problem solving rather than problem discovering. I think most people in pharmacology are looking to find an answer and a solution. And the other thing that I think uh, is somewhat different to some of the sciences is you very, very often have to have one foot in the door of academia and one with industry. Because however good a scientist you are, you're not going to be able to produce a new drug. You're not going to be able to market it. So you have to have that relationship with the commercial sector, large and small. And I always have done. Yeah, and you know, that was my next follow-on question, mm, actually, is about your experience of working with big pharma, smaller biotech, how a university best engages with the private sector, what the pushes and pulls are that are different, and how young scientists who need to publish survive that collaboration, if you will. Well, I've generally had positive experiences, but, but I know many scientists, and particularly younger scientists, feel that you know, industry, oh, no, I don't want to do that, they'll constrain me. There can be some constraints, but I haven't found too many. Um, and there's an interesting contrast, because I've worked with very small biotechs who are exciting, innovative, and fleet of foot. But then I've worked with big pharma who have the resources to be able to do things that you could never dream of doing yourself. And I found that for universities and for scientists, the best approach is not to think about how much money will this pay? What can I get out of it? But look at it as a shared venture where they can bring expertise and skills as well as resource and facilities. And some of my best discussions about problems have been with scientists in academia, which I found very enjoyable. And, and then, of course, I took on a different role because I was a non-executive director of AstraZeneca for nine years. And that was a fantastic experience of understanding how a multi-billion pound multinational company works. And I would bet my house that you've had offers to move into that private sector. So why did you decide to remain an academic given, given that? For me, the heart of being a scientist is training other scientists and having PhD students. And while that is possible in industry, it happens much less. But it's the wider thing of being in an educational institution that I, I mean the students are away at the moment it's lovely and quiet and wonderful mm -hmm. but I miss them but we want yeah. them back exactly <laughs> being in a place where you're educating young people you're training young scientists that for me was at the heart of what I always wanted to do and so I always said no thanks yeah. and I guess I always get a bit upset if someone tells me I can't do something yes so I guess yeah. For me, it's being able to follow your nose as yeah. you will. And as long as you can get the funding to do it, you yeah. can do it. That, that is certainly a, another thing, that, that the sense that... And, and I think it's a, it's a slight myth, as many in industry told me, the idea you can do what you want. They say, well, you haven't got the money to do it. But that doesn't matter. I think I can. You yes, know, if yes, I want to yes. do something different, I think I can do it in a university. Yeah. And mm -hmm. whether I can or I can't, the fact that I feel I've got that freedom. I said to one leader in industry, I said, look, if I don't, if I don't want to go to work tomorrow, I won't. And he said, have you ever done that? No. no. But the point is, no, I feel exactly. I could do. You could, yeah. Can we move to the women in science? You touched mm. on it briefly. I mean, I remember the first time I met Nancy Rothwell, not a dame at that point. Yeah. Um, not a professor. No, no, it was a long time ago. And I was a very new PI, pretty nervous actually, on my first few weeks in Manchester. And, and I walked into your room, and I can't even remember why, but you were in the middle of probably three or four tasks at once. And there was this just incredible energy and enjoyment, as well as the sharp intellect. I mean, have you, have, how did you develop that persona? Have you always been like that? I think um, most successes in life, 90% hard work, enthusiasm, and optimism. And, and do you think it is more difficult for women to achieve in a scientific sphere? Or? As, I, I'm, I'm sure it is, it must be, because there are fewer of them. So I have to acknowledge that. I, often people say, have I found barriers or discrimination? And I've said, no, not really, actually. I, I, my biggest worry is the perception from women that it will be too hard. And I think the perception's probably worse than the reality, actually. And most of the people who've supported me have been men and have been very, very supportive. I really worry about all these discussions about glass ceilings. I go, what glass ceiling? 
what message are you giving to young women to tell them that yeah. they've got to break through sure. this gust ceiling? I mean, if you make that mountain so high, yeah, why would anybody would, even leave yeah, best camp? Exactly, you wouldn't even try. Okay, so if you were starting out as a pharmacologist today, um, what do you think would be the big challenges and, and what advice do you give to those young starters in today's world? I, I would say um, make sure you don't lose the sheer joy of discovery and of research. Find smart people around you to help and advise you and support you. Uh, people who will not only support you, but will in a nice way criticise you and say, actually, that's a mistake. You know, you need somebody sometimes to pull you down and say, stop going down that route. It's not getting anywhere. And the other thing is choose very, very carefully the people you work with and you employ. That They are the people who are going to make or break you. And one wrong decision with somebody you're not going to get on with can be damaging. Um, so I think... Um, but but do look and if you're in a university actually people are so willing to help you and so keen to support young pharmacologists young scientists mm -hmm. in general that you'll find plenty of people just yeah. go and knock on their door like you did with me yes indeed and 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 i guess the, the sort of the, the the billion dollar question so let's just transport ourselves we're both back in the lab full time Good, yeah. budget unlimited yeah. You're looking out there and you're saying, if I was going to go for the big grand challenge research question in pharmacology, what would it be? What are the big unsolved critical questions that we, this, this society of pharmacologists has to address going forward? So, think? I mean, I, I would say this wouldn't I, but it has to be around brain disease, I think, because really we still have so few tools. And I don't mean the ones that everybody talks about, like dementia, which is a big one the massive problem of depression, um, of some of the psychiatric diseases. I think if we could get a better handle, and we are getting better handles, on understanding brain function and dysfunction, that to me is a massive prize, to be able to understand what is it that suddenly, and I'm sure we both know people who are happy individuals suddenly, yeah. not with external factors, suddenly yeah. start to crash. If we could understand that, imagine the difference we could make. That, to me, has to be the area that, you know, with all the tools we're developing, particularly modern imaging, uh, particularly now all the molecular tools and genetic tools and so on, they have to be the big things, but they're tough. Yeah. So now, thinking about you in your role as, as Vice Chancellor and President of this enormous university, looking forwards, um, how on earth do you do it all? You know, you have so many jobs on your CV. You're still running your own research team. How are you managing to do all of that just with 24 hours in every day? <laughs> well, first of all, I should dispel a few myths. Um, to say I run my own research team is probably an exaggeration. Um, I'm lucky enough to have six or seven people who trained with me who have university positions. They do all the hard work and they indulge me. So it's <laughs> wonderful. So I go to the lab meetings, I discuss the problems, you know, I go through the grant applications, I see them with results. I don't have to do all the day-to-day -day hard work. I still teach, I do a few first year lectures. And I think coming back to what I said before, choosing the right people, I have an amazing team of people around me. These are the other leaders in the university, the vice presidents, deputy and so on, who are phenomenal and we work very much as a team. Then I have a brilliant team in my office that uh, are like guard dogs um, and answer so many things. Um, and I think I, I've become, I didn't used to be, but I've become very, very good at prioritising and structuring things. And I'm an avid list writer. I love lists. First thing in the morning. Get yes, that list I love lists. Mainly because I love crossing things off. <laughs> Brilliant. And so I do remember, you know, talking about science and the public. And I do remember with, with uh, really enjoyed your Christmas lectures, sat there riveted. Um, for me, preparing those talks actually is more difficult and takes longer yeah, than doing your regular research. Because you know about that and it's, yeah. it's straightforward to do it. And we all get better at that with practice. But how long did you have to prepare for the Christmas lectures? So... That, I've often said, that was probably the hardest thing I ever did in my career. Um, and I, I, once I've decided to do something, I tend to go full pelt into doing it. So for six months, six months ahead, you start having weekly meetings and you start thinking about it. Because, you know, a 60-minute lecture, on average, you would have 60 demonstrations or examples or pictures. The last three months, it was pretty much full-time. 
and the two weeks before and the two weeks of filming, I bet I didn't get more than four or five hours sleep a night. But it was such fun, but really hard. It wasn't just me giving a lecture, it was knowing which camera I'm looking at, which yeah. spot I'm standing on, what's the cue for the next prop to come on to, where I'm going to get a kid from. You know, it was the whole... But I loved the sort of theatre of it all. Yeah. It was amazing. And I guess, you know, for me, I would just love to see the public understanding science better than they do. And, yeah. and the scientific reporting in the newspapers to be yeah. elevated a little. I mean, do you agree that that's I a do. dimension? We have, of yeah. course, Brian Cox, who's doing yeah. a fabulous job from Manchester. I but... mean, Brian is brilliant. and um, But he gets accused by his fellow scientists of dumbing down. And uh, he shrugs his shoulders and says, well, you know, if I'm getting to five million people, I think that's a fair trade-off. And he doesn't really dumb down. But yeah, the, I mean, it varies. Um, interestingly, apparently there are more column inches, or whatever you measure now, on science than there were 10 years ago, so more is reported. But sometimes you look at it and say, how, how did that arrive? But it's not even reporting of science that I worry about. It's the science behind other things that I think are more of a concern. If it's, if it's a science correspondent telling a science story, they're usually pretty good, actually. One of the worst things since I... I came across was the MMR vaccine and I had a long debate with the media and they said well we gave equal weight to both sides of the argument and I said well that's your problem because 99% of scientists are in one place not yes. the other and yet you gave 50-50 yeah. how so, can that be right yeah. so and it is a bit frustrating sort of following on from that how you can influence of course is your your co-chair of the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology I believe I so I how's that going are you it's allowed fantastic. to tell us? <laughs> yes. We're quite open, actually. Most of our reports are published. Um, they're obviously all directed at the Prime Minister, but many of them are also at other ministers, um, whether for science or treasury and so on. It is uh, one of the most interesting things I've ever done because it's a group of very, very clever people from very different backgrounds, um, Quite a few of them are not scientists. You know, we have economists and um, several economists, actually, and social scientists. And some of what we do is in response to questions from government. Quite a lot of what we do is we ask what we think is an important topic at the moment that we could comment usefully on. And our reports are usually short. We get to meet amazing people. So people come in from industry, from government, and tell us about things that are ongoing. Um, we've had joint meetings with the past president of the United States um, equivalent uh, group. Um, very interesting indeed. And uh, also very, very good support. Uh, so although there are lots of reports written, for me, it's, it's you know a workload that is manageable and very enjoyable. And I guess just to towards the end of getting all these questions that it's great to hear all your answers but when you finish being the vice chancellor and president of the university of manchester what do you want to look back on and say i'm really proud of what i did there i i suppose the university being known for some really big discoveries and important things I, I can't say it was down to me, but it was fabulous a few months after I was appointed that the Nobel Prize was awarded and then I went to the ceremony in Stockholm. Another area, your own area, amazing that we've just been awarded £40 million for cancer research, but also amazing some of the work that's been done on history and culture just last week when they found all of Alan Turing's correspondence in a filing cabinet in one of our departments. And then I suppose the transformation of the campus uh, will all be on a single site uh, by 2020, 2021. Um, too many things, really. But one of the things is um, meeting students and past students. So I've got, a, I've got a, a slide which I show, and it's in two parts. And the first part is a young girl who was in the audience um, for the Christmas lectures that I gave. And then many years later, I was sent a picture by her mother and she's graduating with a first oh, class really? degree in chemistry from the University of Manchester with a note from the daughter saying, you inspired me. Well, that, yeah, that, that's fantastic. Which was amazing. Yeah. And I, and I guess since we are thinking about the British Pharmacological Society today, what do you think they should be focusing on as a society going forward? I feel um, that they do need to embrace the wider inputs to pharmacology. Um, and, and that is happening, but I think it really needs to happen anymore. And by that, I don't just mean molecular genetics. I mean 
new physics, yeah, new nano, materials, exactly, yeah, that, that um, informatics. You know, now there are so many tools that can be input, and we're trying to develop a, a, an institute here, which is about bringing skills across the university for health benefit. And some of those are in the social sciences, are in behaviours, are in business, as well as in physics, in engineering. Some of the systems engineers are some of the best people you could find at designing a way of looking at a complex system, like a brain. You know, it's our computer scientists who are doing a lot of work on brain science. So I, I would urge the society to, to work with people from the very many rather than the immediate areas that impact on pharmacology. Indeed, and, and, and I guess Perhaps the last question today, since we're sitting here in Manchester, one of the things that's special about Manchester, in my view, is we now have a, devol a devolved healthcare system, first one in the UK. What do you think that's, how do you think that's going to help us? What do you see as the main impact of, of Devo Mank, as so-called? Yeah. So the devolution of the health budget, which is £6 billion a year, I think there's a small advantage in allowing that to be targeted to particular local needs, but by far, far the biggest advantage is the fact that the health and the social care budgets are now under the same control. So previously, where there might be a drug that cost a lot of money, um, but allowed people to get back to work six weeks earlier, might not be used because nobody counted the six weeks earlier, they counted the cost of the drug. Yeah. Nobody was looking at, would it actually be cheaper to have earlier diagnostics than have people turn up at hospital with a heart attack? Would it be better for people overall to get them out of hospital quicker and into care homes? There is the possibility of doing yeah, that. that. And, and following it is a lot of interest from a lot of companies, because three million population, all under one control. They're fascinated by the ability to potentially do large-scale trials on those people, uh, whether it's compliance. And of course, Greater Manchester was the first electronic trial, the Salford Lung Study, which was very successful, very cheap. These are the sorts of things that we can be exploring and which pharmacology should be exploring. Doing a trial where you don't have to see the patient. It's all electronic. Yes. I mean, for me, you know, the pharmacology, I think, is this multidisciplinary process. And I think one of the things I recognise in Manchester, having been here for so long now and visited around the country in other countries, and I think you know, your influence is, is showing here, is one of the things Manchester does really, really well is collaborate mm. across boundaries. And I think you know, that, that lack of, if, if you like, ego, this ability to all muck in mm. together on a, on, a, on a single problem, I think is very characteristic of the Mancunian approach. I, I think it is, and it's interesting. A number of us went to a very, very prestigious university overseas um, to talk about Devo Mank. And somebody senior at that university said, how did you get these people all to come? And I said, how do you mean? He said, well, one of them's a health economist, one of them, three medics, one of them's an information technologist, one of them's a social scientist, one of them's a mathematician. Why would they all come? And I said, because they're all interested in the problem and they all see their own strengths being complementary to other strengths. So they're coming together on it and that's what we need to do to solve health issues. Indeed, that might be a, a good place to to end uh, talking to you today, Nancy. Thanks for your time. It's been great to have insight into how you came to be a pharmacologist and how you've developed such a remarkable career since then.